Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole, and today we're going to be talking about how simplifying life for our children and our families can make a significant difference in our children's development, relationships, and overall behavior. Um, the world has gotten more and more complex over time. In many ways, expectations have increased dramatically, even for young children. And I'm finding that many parents are more overwhelmed than ever before. This impacts not only us as parents, but also our children. We've got higher rates of things like anxiety issues, mood problems, behavior issues in children uh, and adults for that matter than ever before. And so it really begs the question of whether we need to step back, slow down, look at how to simplify our lives to better support our children. And given the current situation that we have going on in the world right now with the pandemic that we're facing, I feel like there's never been a better time to look at these issues and to really use this situation that we're all going through right now as an opportunity to step back, to reevaluate, to reprioritize, to develop really some better ways of being with our kids, being with each other as families and building a strong foundation that will allow our families to come out of this crisis situation doing even better than they were before. And I do believe that that's possible. And my guest on the show today is going to help us think about all of that. Um, Kim John Payne is here to talk with us about why simplifying is really important and even how we can accomplish that. So let me tell you a bit about him. A consultant and trainer to more than 60 U.S. independent and public schools, Kim John Payne has been a school counselor, adult educator, consultant, researcher, and educator for ne nearly 30 years and a private family counselor for more than 15 years. He regularly gives keynote addresses at international conferences for educators, parents, and therapists, and runs workshops and training sessions around the world. In each role, he's been helping children, adolescents, and families explore issues such as social difficulties with siblings and classmates, attention and behavioral issues at home and school, and emotional issues such as defiance, aggression, addiction, and low self-esteem. He's a partner of the Alliance for Childhood in Washington, D.C. He has consulted for educational um, associations around the world. He's been a project director of the Waldorf Collaborative Counseling Program at Antioch University, New England, and many, many other things that he has uh, done to support educators and families and children. Um, he has a wife and two children of his own, and I believe lives on a farm, and maybe he'll tell us a bit more about that. Um, has a book titled Simplicity Parenting, Using the Extraordinary Power of Less to Raise Calmer, Happier, and More Secure Kids. Um, it's a wonderful book. I've been very much looking forward to this conversation. Uh, welcome to the show, Kim. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Lovely to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So when we scheduled this several months ago, neither of us could have anticipated that the world would be quite in this place when we sat down to have this conversation. But really, I don't think the timing could be better, actually, um, to be talking about these concepts and the ways that, that we can be supporting families at this time. Um, so I'd love to start by having you talk a bit about this idea of simplicity. One of the things that you say in the book that really stood out to me is many parents are building their families on the four pillars of too much, too much stuff, too many choices, too much information, and too fast. Um, and that, that really resonates with me in the work that I do with families and what I'm seeing. So um, let, let's start out talking a bit about that. Mm. Yeah, this came up for me uh, um, years ago when I was, um, as a younger guy, working in refugee camps in Southeast Asia, um, just at the end of the Vietnam War. I was working in uh, Jakarta, working in the Thai Cambodian refugee camps, and I came to see, um, I came to see stressed kids very, you know, very personally every single day. And prior to that, I'd been working in group homes uh, back in my birth country of Australia for very stressed kids, abused kids, stressed kids. But imagine my surprise when uh, I, that was over, when my time in the refugee camps was, was over, uh, I came to, um, to study more. I wanted to do postgrad work and I moved to London in the UK. And um, I set up a little family counseling practice on the side of my studies. And um, 
there I was seeing wartime kids. They were nervous, jumpy, hypervigilant, um, just like the kids that I'd left behind in, in Cambodia. Um, this, it was kind of the same. It was like, it was like we were living in an undeclared war on childhood. And, and, and yet I'd look at these kids' lives and they were relatively normal, so to speak. Um, they, uh, they didn't have war trauma, but what they had was unrelenting, under the radar, new normal of too much, too soon, too sexy, too young. Mm -hmm. And that that was building up a cumulative charge of stress. It wasn't wartime stress, so to speak, uh, with very large, very scary events. But the brain and the, and the social and emotional uh, reality of that on these children's beings was that they looked just like wartime kids. And um, they were from regular families. You know, they were from different racial backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds. And that started a lifelong puzzle for me. It really, it was a, a huge puzzle. Um, it was a big surprise because I thought I was, I was, you know, now going to have this lovely little um, country practice. I had James Harriet in mind, you know. I thought, oh, I'm going to have some little rascals come through the door and I'm going to... And through the door came these kids who were pretty much the same, um, reacting in, in a very, not same, but in a similar way to the kids uh, who, had, who had gone through war. One of the things that they had in common um, when I started really looking into this, and it took a little bit of uh, um, courage, perhaps, I don't know. I was a bit worried about it. I thought this can't be the case because that, that's just too weird. Um, but when I started looking into it, I started realizing it was this new normal, this ubiquitous nature of stress and how life has sped up so much. So slowly, relatively slowly over the last 20 or 30 years. And we look around our neighborhood and our neighbors are living in the same way. We look at the kids at school, they're living in the same way. So we sort of make the presumption, well, it's got to be okay, right? That's just the way things are. And so that's where, the, that's where this journey began is trying to figure out what was going on um, and then, and what to do about it. Mm -hmm. Such a, a fascinating, um, just awareness there about that, that the kids that you were seeing out of really, you know, obvious traumatic war torn situations were responding in much the same way that kids in our communities are now. And that idea of just too, too much coming at them all the time. And, you know, we've seen a huge increase in the number of kids diagnosed with, things like ADHD, autism spectrum disorders, behavioral disorders, all of that. And it does beg the question of how much of that is related to just the environment that, that kids are in and just how much is coming at them all the time and, and their ability to make sense of that and to respond to that appropriately. Well, one of the things um, that uh, I did because of postgrad studies and because I, you know, I, I like to sort of obviously move beyond one's own opinions, right? So uh, we did some studies into this and with various populations of kids, kids with ADHD, for example, which I, I never, uh, attention deficit is such a silly name to call it. It's not a deficit, it's an excess, but it's misprioritized. Just, just to, to say real quick, but the, um, we did studies into this and, the long and short of it, what I came to realize is that all kids are quirky. They all have their quirks. It what make, it's what makes them so lovable and kind of infuriating too sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they all have their quirks. But if we add cumulative stress, the new normal of too muchness to their life, that little quirk becomes problematic. It becomes a little bit fevered. And then it, it can, if it continues on too long, it can become a disorder. Um, but the, like an example would be a, a child who is just a busy child, very busy. They're always on the go. But you add a lot of stress to that child. And, and in a sense, neurologically, you're saying to him or her or them that uh, you, you are under threat. Because that's what, that's what this life is doing. It's, it's the, 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 that we've gotten so used to in some ways. But what's happening is the amygdala, the fight or flight, freeze or flock brain is starting to actually grow for the first time in human evolution. The actual size of the amygdala is now starting to grow and not shrink. It's, mm -hmm. it's remarkable, truly, really, truly remarkable. 
and the um, so there's this threat, underlying threat that I, I am not coping. A child's system is just n nervous system is just not coping with with what they're being asked to do. Very very few of us have, as adults were ever asked to cope with what our kids are coping with now, just the pace of what they're asked, being asked to cope with. And so what happens is that, that busy kid, for example, becomes, becomes uh, problematic. And then even, even so-called ADHD, the child who just likes to have things orderly, the orderly child mm -hmm. um, becomes a bit rigid, stuck, stubborn. But if the, but if the um, unrelenting new normal of the supersized family life continues, they become OCD, mm -hmm. obsessive, compulsive. Um, if a child is just a bit feisty, it's just great. She, he, they are just a bit feisty. Um, if the, if their amygdala and um, starts firing and adrenaline and cortisol starts pumping through their systems at a high level, they're going to um, not just be feisty, but they're going to fight you back. They're going to make things problematic for you. Everything becomes hard as a parent. But if it continues on, um, their quirk not only becomes problematic, it becomes opposition defiance disorder or even conduct disorder. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the remarkable thing, and Nicole, this is where this, is where this was just so um, uplifting uh, because all that's very depressing and I'm told I'm good <laughs> at that. But the, so it's, oh, that's okay. So that's pretty depressing. But, and, and the really significant but here is that as we simplify children's lives in our studies, mm -hmm. and as now this has gone even further, because we have over 1,200 simplicity parenting coaches and group leaders around the world, so we've got a lot, a lot of experience in this over the over the um, last couple of decades. What happens is that that same thing that is a disorder slides back along a spectrum and just becomes their quirk again. Mm -hmm. uh, as as we bring cumulative simplicity, not cumulative stress. But as we dial back life, slow it down so that their nervous systems can cope, they just become quirky. That funny little, that funny little boy or girl, just there they are. There's their quirk again. Mm -hmm. But the remarkable the thing, the moving thing happens is that once parents realize that and they, 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 they see things like all the time, I feel like I've got my little girl back. I feel like I've got my little boy back. They're back. It's remarkable. We didn't have to do anything. We didn't have to read any books. We didn't have to do, learn anything. We just had to do less. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to do less in some ways. Mm -hmm. But as they keep doing less, because this is, this, this is very much when you realize that doing less, you get your kid back. They, they hold true to that. The very same thing that was their disorder is actually their gift. Mm -hmm. It's their gift. The very busy child who was ADHD, their gift is that they're the, they're movers and shakers in the world. The, um, the 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 very the very feisty kid who was opposition defiance disordered when they were stressed, when the brain was pumping out adrenaline and cortisol, when the brain is calmer. Um, now what they're doing is is that they're the warriors. They're the kids who'll stand up for the weak. They're the kids who are not, they will stand up all right, but in, in the past they were standing up for themselves and pushing back and fighting back. We reduce that need for them to fight back. And now what they're gonna do is they're still gonna stand up, but they stand up for others. And it's beautiful to see these gifts start coming. And, and what's so uplifting is that the choice is ours. I'm not denying that there is you know, ADD, ODD, PDD, OCD, there's no shortage of Ds. <laughs> what I'm suggesting, though, is <clears throat> that through giving children a childhood, which is embarrassing to even say, right, that, <clears throat> excuse me, shouldn't be a radical suggestion. Giving children a childhood shouldn't be radical, but it is. And doing that, um, their gift is, is, is revealed. Mm. It's such a, a wonderful way to think about that and, and really um, very hopeful and very empowering because what you're saying that you found in um, you know, the research that you did and in applying this now uh, is that parents really do have the power to shift these things in a positive direction for kids. And that, 
that, uh, you know, obviously is what I believe as well, but it does stand somewhat in opposition to a lot of the, the mainstream sort of information out there, which is these are, you know, brain-based, chemically-based disorders. If your child has this, there's, you know, nothing you can uh, do except these, you know, standard treatments and, and some medication, and this is what it is. And, and what we're saying is, no, actually, there's a lot of things that we have the power to shift to support children to develop in a way that can have these things then be strengths or at least not have them go down the path of becoming significant disabilities or problems for them. Well, I think probably, yeah, beautifully put, actually. I think what probably what you and I can both agree on is that it is chemically based. It is brain based. There is a, there's no denying it. There is a reality um, to that. But if it's biochemistry, if it's brain based and if it's if it's if it's the the, the hormones and, chemi and, and and the chemicals that the body produces the, the obvious question is why is the body producing them yeah. and if we can and and my experience over long periods of time now with hundreds of thousands of kids is that we can be empowered because those that 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 particularly adrenaline and cortisol, and now we have a new, we have a third uh, customer, and that's dopamine. High levels of dopamine caused by gaming and and, and online activity, uh, pleasure and reward. Kids get addicted to pleasure and reward, where everything has to be pleasurable and rewarding, uh, very easily, very easily. Um, but all that, all those tendencies, we can have a good hand in in. Um, keeping those that secretion of those hormones of those of those biochemicals into the brain by giving a child more space more grace more time to decompress and then the and then the, the child's not being flooded it's a little bit like this the way I, the way i look at it is that uh, our, the, the, the metaphor if i may um our children it was like they 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 have this sort of vessel within their being it's like a think of it as it's just the vessel of their being in that sense and there's a tap above it and that tap is is just is 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 filling the cup beautifully right that's just life it's all the friends they have it's the things they do the schoolwork they do the the playing with siblings it's the bedtime stories it's all you know it's the helping prepare food it's and that's all just filling the cup and and it's allowing the child to 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 have that water of life so to speak it's a lovely thing it's what they need but when there's too much of that lovely thing too much of that great stuff because we've all we've got so much access in the west particularly the great stuff when there's too much of that great stuff the tap is just pouring and that in too much and it's spilling out over the edge it's filling up and it's spilling and there's spillage now that spillage is 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 uh, it's overwhelming a child's vessel to hold all this and that spillage is is what we call behavior behavior bad behavior so called is just communication behavior is communication no more no less and what a child is trying to communicate to us is that it's too much mom it's too much i can't do all this they'll sit at the at the at the table and just some kids just weeping with the amount of homework that they've got to do after an eight hour day for example now our our um, decision as parents is is do, do we spend our life mopping up dealing with with difficult behavior with pushback behavior with with even even disorderly behavior disordered behavior do we spend our life mopping up or do we put our hand on the tap and turn it down? That's all. And it's a decision. And I've, it's been remarkable how many countless numbers of people have had this gut feeling that something is not right. Something is off with this. And what the Simplicity Parenting Movement has, has done amongst others is given permission to parents to turn down the tap. As simple as that. And then then the child is getting the right amount of nutrients to go through each day and not building up this rather toxic charge of, of, of nervous system overwhelm. It's, it's uh, exactly the same uh, way that I talk to parents about that too. Their cup is overflowing. Um, and yeah, we need to turn down the flow, especially if parents have a child with neurodevelopmental issues where they are slower to take in and make sense of the things going on around them in the first place, the faster that 
uh, that tap is, is turned up, the more they're going to struggle and the quicker they're going to get overwhelmed. So such an important way for people to think about it. And right now, with what we're all living through with our, our children and our families, with um, this pandemic and, and most families sheltering in place and kids being out of school and all of that, um, you and I were talking before um, we started the interview about um, how many parents are feeling even more overwhelmed right now because they have had a lifestyle and they've built their family and, and managed their kids around lots of busyness, lots of externally driven kinds of activities. And now those are taken away and these families are really struggling. Um, let, let's talk a bit about what you're seeing with that. And then that will, I think, lead us into some things that families can start to do even right now um, to, to help. Yeah. There's really, um, the, the, there's really four four major things that I'm sent that I'm seeing uh, that families can do because I've been working with families now for about six to eight weeks uh, with this pandemic because I work with families in in Asia, China, Taiwan, and so on. So um, that's not exhaustive in terms of my own experience. So I don't claim this in any way to be the last word. But what I've seen in the last couple of months, uh, two and a half months, is has been that. The first thing to do to to when when the world outside is dis disorderly, things everything's changing. There are a few things that we can do to give a child the message that you know what you're secure and you're safe here at home. And and I want to just um, go over four of them, just just sort of headlining each for each one of these. The first one that many parents have found is to declutter the home is to um, start with the pantry, the kitchen, start with your space first as a parent, um, so that a child doesn't feel you're invading their, their bedrooms and so on, but just declutter, tidy up, get everything in order, um, and then go out to the lounge room. And then from the, from the lounge room, have the children help as much as they can, depending on their age. Mm -hmm. But the, um, even if they're helping in a tiny little way for just a few short minutes, they're, they're taking part. And just start to become orderly and then and then move into the child's bedroom and really look at the amount of toys, the amount of clothes, the amount of books. The average American child has 150 toys per child. And the, that means a 3,000 piece Lego set counts as one. That's one. And then if you've got two or three kids, you're pushing 400, 500 toys. Mm -hmm. And just start, um, you know, decluttering, just sort of a, a pretty radical declutter. Mm -hmm. What that is, what that has done is that it signals to a child, here in our home we have space, mm -hmm. here in our home we have order, here in here in our home we do not have chaos. Out there, a lot is going on, and kids kind of know it, even if they they even if they don't know a lot. If, if we've been successful in keeping the news away from them, mm -hmm. things have changed, mm -hmm. and they're aware of it. Of course, they're home. And giving that space has, um, it, it's one parent said to me uh, recently, it's almost like we can breathe now. Yeah. So, and it's not saying, see, in the West, we tend to be, and in in particularly North America, we tend to be a very verbal culture. And we'll say to children, you are safe, you are safe, you are safe. The more we say that to a child, the more they don't feel safe, because why is my mum saying that? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, right. But, but if we can show them, through four simple ways they are. And this is one of them. We actually show it to them in their environment because children are very plugged into their environment. So we can show them that the environment is orderly. That's saying you are safe without saying the words. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's actually saying it to their bodies, to their whole somatic being. Mm -hmm. The second way um, that uh, we've noticed is to have more predictability and rhythm at home that's immediately saying to a child you're safe if they wake up and they know that in the morning we do like for a couple for, for maybe 35 to 40 minutes i would add maximum they do their their, their school work mm -hmm. um, some schools are being really good about this and they're not overwhelming yeah. kids um, but i've got to say nicole if, if i've been speaking to, actually it was three families in a row yesterday in my private practice and these were from different countries because I have this video based um, family practice people all over the world. So it's, it's not just us centric. 
and all three of them, uh, uh, two mums and a dad, were tearing up at just the overwhelm of what the school was doing, mm -hmm. just throwing stuff at them. One mum said, I've run out of ink because I, I had to print out 45 pages this morning. And this was for a third grader, right? A nine, 10 year old. Yeah. And it's just outrageous what mm -hmm. the schools are doing. The schools are not meaning to add to the family stress because there's some parents who want that sort of support, particularly stay at home parents. Can, but what about the mo most of us who are working parents? How, do we, how on earth do we actually do that? Right. What do we do? Because now we're working remotely from home. And so how does all that, so my advice, is to get much more rhythm in home and limit, really strictly limit the amount of schoolwork that you do, the amount of that more academic book-based um, work. Pick and choose what you do. You, our first loyalty to, is to our kids. And if the schools want to do that, then okay, they can do it, but it's our choice of how much we do. And I've been in contact with a number of, of um, administrators and uh, um, school teachers and said, look, is it okay if the parents just pick and choose? And they say, of course. I say, well, please yeah. tell them that. Right. Because they feel they have to do everything, right. all of this. So that's one point. So to go from allowing like 45 minutes, depending on the child's age in the morning, an hour if they're a little older, if they're in high school, maybe two, three hours. But that's it. That's it. And then so for you know, a 10-year-old, something like they get up in the morning and they know how they're going to get up. Their breakfast is the same way. The, 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 what they do, they clean up in the same way. They then sit down at the kitchen table in the same way, as much as possible, uh, within reason. And um, then they have snack in the same way. Then in mid-morning, that's when they move from more thinking, cognitive work, into more, um, I, I call this project-based work or artistic work. Uh, just if they can draw, they can paint, they can model, they can, they can get a project out. One little boy had completely deconstructed his mother's vacuum cleaner because he wanted to figure out how it worked. Yeah. And then he put it back together again. It took a whole week and he made all these new nozzles out of ice cream containers that would make the, he was that type of child, you know. Like, um, and that took him a full week. And, and the mum said he did it from about 10 o'clock through to about 12.30. Mm -hmm. Every single day he did that project. There's all kinds of projects that we can do with our kids. By the way, just a little tip. I like to have project boards, a piece of ply, a piece of wood, about two foot by three foot, so that the project doesn't have to be cleaned up. The board can just get picked up and put under a bed. Yeah. The board can just go away. So the project can come out the next day and then we don't have to do a complete restart. We don't have to think, we don't have to, as parents, we're not educators. Um, we, we don't have to think of a new idea every day. There can be ideas that carry from day to day. And if you have a board to put things on, mm -hmm. then they can go away and come back out again, like an old friend coming back. A day is a long time for a child and comes back out. It's lovely. So, um, and then lunch, maybe just a bit of quiet time. And then the afternoon, we move more into activity, riding bikes, if that's possible, if you're in a sort of a suburban or country environment, going for walks in the park, but doing something active. It might even be building a fort. It might be playing basketball, uh, you know, out in the drive, whatever it is. So we move from, from, from our head to our heart, to the creativity, to our hands in the afternoon, from cognition to creativity to action. Mm. And that's generally the three steps of rhythm. But if we can keep a strong rhythm, mm -hmm. and if even if we have rhythms like we're gonna eat at a certain time, we're just gonna do that now, we're gonna to go to bed in a certain way, we're gonna we're gonna have this be very, very rhythmical. And even if the family is rhythmical now, step up the rhythms. Mm -hmm. And if the day gets a bit weird, like if one mum I was speaking to yesterday, she has meetings, video meetings on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings. So how can she can't be at the kitchen table with the children doing the school based work? So she just brings the, the, the project based work back into the morning time. So the children are doing their work in their project. She doesn't need to supervise that, not so heavily at all. And then she uh, is on her meeting. She finishes her meeting and then in the mid morning, they do their schoolwork. I think within reason, it, uh, it needs to shift and we can give our kids a heads up the evening before and we can say, hey guys, tomorrow, here is the rhythm of the day. You might even want to write it down. 
here at Simplicity Parenting, we provide rhythm, a daily rhythm clock with lots of little icons for little children so they can see what's coming next. They actually go to this little picture-based clock. It doesn't have numbers on it, it's just pictures. And they look, and it's really amazing, they just look. And they'll say, okay, snack coming next, it's snack. And it's like, it's like anxiety arnica. It's like, it just soothes them to know what's coming next. So that's rhythm. Mm. They're the first two. The third one is, is just allowing kids to be bored, is giving kids the gift of boredom. And I know this almost is counterculture, but it's okay they're bored. It's because out of boredom comes creativity. But if kids are bored and you've got two or three kids at home, separate them because they'll take out their boredom on each other. Yes. <laughs> so separate them for, yeah, right, for, for, for a few minutes, like 20, 15, 20 minutes, just separate them so they, they don't start going at each other. Tr it, re resist the urge to turn the screen on, to turn the iPad on, because that's very short-term entertainment. Let them be bored for a while. And, it's, and if, if a child comes to me and says, oh, well, actually one mum made it, she had a great response. The child's saying, there's nothing to do. And the mum said, oh, something to do is just around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Such a great response. I love that. Right? Um, <laughs> But personally, when my kids come to me and say, there's nothing to do, uh, you know, my response is, um, oh, dear. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. that, that's it. Oh, dear. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, oh. But that's it. Let them be bored because out of boredom comes creativity, self-creativity, self-motivation. Mm -hmm. It's not turning on a screen and watching someone else's creativity. Because that is someone else's creativity. Uh, it's not the child's. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think children need to be bored is, is that they, they need to be creative. Because creativity, deep creative play and projects, is how children digest the world. It's how the children digest what's going on around them. And they cleanse themselves of the anxiety. Again, it's this anxiety cleansing. Mm -hmm. When we let children be bored, the next step is created. Well, the first step is antsiness, right. but the next step is deep creative play. Mm -hmm. And out of deep creative play comes the ability to just let go of the nervousness, the anxiousness, mm -hmm. the stuff that's going on around them. Now more than ever, children need to be allowed boredom so they can go into deep creative play and therefore just digest things, play it out. You know, that's the, there's a saying of playing it out. That's what they're doing. Many kids now are playing out Corona games. They've got them. They're playing them out. They're playing fevers and doctors and nurses as little kids. They're, they're playing out all this stuff and they're just playing their hearts out. I remember my daughter coming back when she was younger. I got two kids and when she was coming back and she'd been to a place where there wasn't a home where the children in play dates that weren't allowed to be on computers and TVs. And we used to like our kids going there because mm -hmm. they'd play, they'd really play. Anyway, she got in the car and I said, how did it go, love? And she said, oh, daddy, we played really hard today. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I mean, yeah. exactly, right? She played so hard. Mm -hmm. And you know, they really got down into, into deep, deep creativity. Now more than ever, kids need to do that. And if I may, just the fourth thing, Nicole. Yes, please. Um, um, the fourth is is that of filtering out adult the, the adult information. We've just got to be really, really careful what we're saying in front of kids these days and what we're allowing them to see and hear. Before I say anything in front of my kids, all 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 their lives, I've asked myself four very simple little questions. Number one is, is, is this kind? Am I about to speak something or about someone that is kind? And if it's unkind or got a sarcastic edge to it or critical edge, just don't want to say it. If I don't want my child to be sarcastic or critical, I've got to model that, number one. Number two is, 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 that, is, is this going to um, uh, help them feel secure? Is this going to, or is this going to scare them? So, so kind, securing. Um, is this actually true to my family values? Do I want to be scaring my kids with this information? Tell them stuff they have no power to change. And, and, and number four is, is this absolutely necessary? Can, do I have to say this now? So 
is it is it kind is it securing um and is is it true to my values and is it necessary and unless i can answer yes to all four of those questions don't say it just mm -hmm. simply mm -hmm. don't say it i think that more now than ever that needs to be the case we've got to really watch what our kids are hearing directly from us um, and we've got to watch what they're seeing and what they're hearing on screen media. Mm -hmm. Again, it's crucial now because you, you know this, Nicole, and many of, of the listeners will know this, but if a child hears a report about a death toll in Italy and, oh, I heard one today about in Italy, um, and this is a shocking thing to say, but it's just was on the news and, um, that they're using ice skating rinks as morgues. Mm -hmm. And it was like a body blow when I heard that. It was like really affected me mm -hmm. when I heard that. But then I heard it 15 minutes later, and then I heard it again. Mm -hmm. and, I, again and, and over a couple hour period, I heard that four, five, six times. I kept hearing it. Now, the way the brain works is that it hears it once, and it's scared. It, there's a scared. There's a fight or flight reaction. You hear it a second time, and you get the same. You get the you, you get the same adrenaline and cortisol. Only now it's a confirmation of the scariness. Mm -hmm. So every time we hear the same thing, even if it's the same, it makes us more and more and more scared. We don't we don't actually develop this fatigue uh, nearly as quickly as people think. Mm -hmm. So children. Right now, I think if what if what we can do is just turn on the TV, turn on the radio in the morning when the kids aren't around, get our information because mm -hmm. maybe we, we need that. Okay, I get that, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. Not a lot is going to change in a day, right? Really, and then the next day, turn it on, get our information. Better still, read a read a newspaper even online, and then put it away so we don't scare ourselves because it's the same for us. Yeah. If we keep hearing this stuff over and over. What happens is that, is that, as you know, Nicole, our, our levels of anxiety rise and our children know it and they pick it up and they've got nowhere as a safe harbor anymore because they sense our nervous system is on a high alert mm -hmm. and we're no longer a safe harbor. The children can't co-regulate with us anymore. And so if we limit the amount of news, if we ourselves as adults get exercise, do the things we love to do, journal paint do yoga you know there's a lot of it a lot of um people talking about this now even if it's very brief mm -hmm. with the kids at home it might just be five minutes of stretching honestly it's mm -hmm. really really brief um but if we're doing that and we're um uh doing that for ourselves our kids can co-regulate but we've also got to radically mm -hmm. filter the amount of screen media that our kids are being exposed to because they're home more and it's really tempting just to turn the television on or put an iPad in their hand. And that is gonna, the, 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 the result of that will be scary for them, just straight up it will. I don't say many, I don't say will very often in my life because who knows, but that will scare them. Then they go on to high alert and then the result of that is that they, they, their quirk becomes inflamed and all of a sudden their behavior is becoming much, much more problematic. So if we want our kids to be, to have a, a time of connection and closeness and fun in these, in these coming weeks and months ahead, we will radically limit the amount of screen media and information that they're receiving because, because otherwise their behavior is gonna become problematic. So it's so simple to have their behavior not move along that spectrum into problem or disorder. Is, is that these is to follow these four really simple things declutter, increase rhythm, allow them time to decompress and be bored, and then limit screen media and adult information. Those four things will see us coming out of this in pretty good shape as parents, as families. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and you know, people may be listening and thinking, well, you know, my child has all of these significant problems or we, we tend to, to think about all the reasons that even simple things won't work and yet what you and I know from working with families so long is these are exactly the things that do work and so I want to really encourage people don't uh, don't think that something is so simple that that it can't have a profound effect because these things actually do these are the foundations of supporting children in all aspects of their development, but particularly as you're talking about the, the reduction in anxiety and stress that everybody's experiencing right now by sort of 
you know, cocooning a bit like this and focusing on these simple things, it, it has just a profound effect on, on their brain, on their behavior, um, just so important. It's a, it's a nice term you use, Nicole. I hadn't thought of that before as cocooning mm -hmm. because out of a cocoon comes a beautiful butterfly, if I can extend that metaphor. Um, and my, my hope is that um, when this pandemic starts to quieten down, if we have followed these four simple protocols, if, if we have managed to declutter, if we have managed to just have more rhythm and predictability in a child's life, if we have managed just to give them the gift of boredom and to limit the amount of adult information that they're getting through screens particularly, if we've managed to do that, then when, we, when this pandemic starts to quieten down, whenever it does, we're going to come out in just so much closer, better shape. We're actually going to come out stronger as a family, more connected as a family and more in love as, as a family. And that then um, my secret hope for this is that parents may say, more parents may say, you know what, that was a really lovely way to be. And we're going to continue doing this. We're not going to buy back in mm -hmm. to the weirdness of that new normal. Mm -hmm. This is who we are now. And we're going to keep to this as much as possible. Mm -hmm. That's my secret hope. Yeah. Not so secret now. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I think let's just make that a public hope um, <laughs> that, that, that that's what happen, it happens. And I, and I do, I do see families reprioritizing, thinking about these things, making those shifts. And then, um, you know, the, the goal is to think about how that can continue, because ultimately, I think many children, especially children, with neurodevelopmental challenges, mental health challenges, um, will be better off for this period of slowing down. And, and let's not push them back into the chaos and the overwhelm that just exacerbates their issues. Let's continue that then so that they can really do better long-term. Well, kids who are not neurotypical, you know, um, over the, the years, and now we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, this isn't just a small sample size, um, a really significant part of, 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 of um, kids and families that we've been working with are kids who um, have various challenges. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen without doubt, uh, and I, I, I don't mean to be, be overly secure in saying that, but without doubt is that there are changes, very, very positive changes in their behavior when, when life moves back from that overwhelm, when we turn down the tap, mm -hmm. when we move back from that. Now, let's say a child still needs some form of therapy. Let's still say they need some sensory integration treatment or, uh, you know, let's just use that as an example, sensory integration or art therapy or counseling or whatever. Um, when a child comes into, into sensory integration treatment and their cup is now drained, the, 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 the tap is being turned down, then there's room for that wonderful help to, to, to actually be held. The irony of having a child come into, for example, sensory integration when there's a sensory overwhelm and then the, and the senses are flowing out, it means the therapy becomes a part of the problem. Right. It, it, it becomes a part of the getting in the car, getting the kid there, going, managing, the, and it, it becomes a part of the breathlessness of life. But when the child's calmer and comes into that counseling session, you know, a teenager who's having anger issues, uh, a, a teenage girl who's self-harming or having eating um, issues, a, a child um, who, is, is really struggling socially and is having play therapy, whatever, whatever it is, over the, now this is many years now, countless numbers of parents and therapists actually have said to us, the efficacy, the effectiveness of what the therapist was able to do is, is dramatically at best and somewhat at least improved because now the, now the whole system of the child is 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 such that the, that this wonderful help from these wonderful therapists can now not be just spillage, a part of the spillage, but a part of the nutrient, mm -hmm. not spillage, but nutrient. Mm -hmm. So well said. Uh, you and I could continue this conversation all day. So many things to to talk about, but I know that we need to 
wrap up and I want to make sure that people know where to find out more about you, your simplicity, parenting work, the resources that you have to offer. Yeah. Where can people go? Um, well, I know, I know exactly what you mean by that question, Nicole, but where people can go primarily is to their instincts to protect the child. But I know what you mean. I mean, it's um, to their hearts, to their instincts, right? Because all we've got to do is listen to our heart, listen to our instinct to protect our child. And we know we need to dial it back. Most of us, you know, look at life and say, t t enough already, right. enough. Yeah. But what we do uh, at Simplicity Parenting, at the website simplicityparenting.com, is that we have, we offer all kinds of very concise, small, uh, doable ways mm -hmm. to, to simplify. Um, we have a podcast on iTunes and also accessed, it's called the Simplicity Diaries. And every week, I, I, don't, I never know what is going to come up. Uh, I just take questions from the families I work with see what is most current, what is most on their heart, and then record a five to seven, nine minute max piece on practically what you can do about that sibling issue, about, we did one, we did a four part series recently on gunplay and young boys. What can you, why, and what can you practically do that is doable, that is really humble and doable. Everything that, that has to go in our office has to go through the filter of doability. Um, so at, at um, Simplicity Parenting, that's like a central place to go to. And then there's all kinds of very simple courses to do, home practice guides. Uh, we, we have these home practice guides where it, it step by step by step walks people through and supports them in the journey to simplify. And we've actually just releasing one uh, roundabout now when we go to air with this, there'll be a home practice guide for people to take a deeper dive into simplicity. And that'll be right there on simplicityparenting.com. So the timing of this is actually really great if anyone wants to take a deeper dive into this. Yeah, and your website is filled with so many resources, including some that you've gotten up there just in the last couple of weeks related to um, you know, pandemic situation for people who want to delve into that a little more. But um, I, I really want to encourage uh, all of our listeners to check out the, the resources and the information that you have. They're just really amazing things and, and obviously um, get the book as well. So um, Kim, I can't thank you enough for being willing to spend the time uh, talking with me today and talking with our, our listeners. This has been just, um, just wonderful information. Thank you so much. It's so great that you would open up the space for this to talk about this, particularly in this time, Nicole. It's, it's, I'm very grateful to you and the community for, um, for focusing on this. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And thank you to all of you for being here and listening today. We'll catch you next time for our next episode of The Better Behavior Show.